Uh, can I tell you, uh, I have a message for you today that is the actual third message of this week. I didn't want to bring this today. <laughs> but God, I said, God, I want to I speak this. He said, that's not it. Try again. And I had another one, and he said, that's also not it. This is what I want you to share today. And so can I tell you something? Today's message was hard for me. And because it was hard for me, I'm going to need your help today. Because this, this message was one that God asked me to ask myself before I asked you today. That's not fun all the time. But yet, God is, God is doing something. And I believe when we can answer the questions that will come at the end of this time that we have together, that you'll see that it's time. Are you ready? All right, let's, get, let's go. So a couple of weeks ago, about two weeks ago, there was a revival, you may have heard of it, that started on the campus of Asbury University. It's a, it is a university that is in Kentucky that actually has, is known for having outpourings of God's Spirit in different times, uh, happened in the 70s, happened later after that, but it just happened again. And from that revival actually started springing up on other college campuses, other revivals. And we were talking about it just a little bit last week, and as we were talking about it, in between the services, I got a message that said, the Asbury revival is shifting. And then I, I was like, what do you mean it's shifting? We were talking about how excited we were because revival was here and it was all over the place. And yet in the middle of our two services, the president of the university got up and said, the Asbury outpouring, the Asbury awakening that has taken place is going to begin to shift because we are going to basically get back to what it was that we were doing. We had a chapel service that started from our young people that just exploded. It was going for 24 hours a day for almost two weeks or a little bit longer than two weeks. But on Thursday of that following week, just this last week, he said it's going to shift because our focus and our attention needs to be back on our students and because we also believe that revival is not to be contained in this one place, but it is supposed to go out and be spread all over the world and it is supposed to go to the local church houses. The local church houses. And so they shifted and yet when they shifted, they started looking at what this was going to look like and they said, there's so many people that have come to Asbury, but we want you to go to where you're from and sh let revival break forth there. And what was interesting was that the revival was technically ending, but yesterday at Rupp Arena, which is the college basketball arena for Kentucky University, housed thousands of young people that were again gathered together to just continue worshiping and continue the outpouring that God was doing. And here's the thing about this outpouring that was so incredible is that it was simple. There wasn't a whole ton of things going on. It was just people getting together. And here's what they did, what we did this morning. They, just, they worshiped God. They said, God, you were great. But in that worship of God, listen to what happened. People began to repent. And that's the key, is that they began to turn their hearts because repentance is ultimately realigning yourself, recognizing the fact that I am not in line with what God is doing, and my heart is not in the right place, so I need to repent. I need to realign myself to who God is and what he wants in my life. And so these young people were realigning themselves. They were saying, God, we don't need the flashy. We just need to be realigned to you because there's nothing like your presence. And watch this, as it was ending, there was a pastor by the name of Kells Johnson. He said this, he said, the moment of revival has ended, but the era of revival has begun. 
The era of revival has begun, he said, because revival was not intended again to, he echoed the sentiments of the president of the university, it's not intended to be contained within four walls, but it's supposed to go out and make a difference because when God's spirit is poured out, it's not just poured out to be stuck, but it's poured out to be poured out again. And so he said, the era of revival is beginning. And we are currently living in this era of revival because of the fact that the revival is now coming to the local church because the local church has to be the catalyst to say we are going to be the ones that are going to follow in that same model that says we are going to repent. We are going to realign ourselves. We are going to find where it is in our lives that we are not focused on who God has been or who God wants to be and realign ourselves to his purpose and to his will. And did I tell you that this was going to be hard? Because God asked me to ask myself, where is my realignment needed? Where am I? What are the areas in my life that are not aligned to God and his purpose and his will that need to be opened up? And if you've ever asked God to search you and look at your heart, It is a hard place to be, and yet it is the most amazing place to be because the presence and the peace that comes from God when you sit at his feet and say, God, search me because I just want you. Something happens. And so what I want to do before we get into this message today is I want to stop for just a moment, and I want us as a church to say that we believe that revival is going to come to the church house Because I want us to agree and believe that we are going to not be people that just watch revival, but we are going to live in revival. So would you pray with me today? Heavenly Father, today we come to you and we just say, God, as hard as it might be, do your work in us. God, because we don't want to hear about revival, we want to live in revival. We want to be part of what it is that you are doing in this earth. God, we want to see an outpouring of your spirit here at the hill, Vallejo. God, we want to see an outpouring of your spirit in our city. God, we want to see every church house across this city full because we want your kingdom to move forward. We want to see your kingdom come to Vallejo as it already is in heaven. And so, God, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon us, as you've already promised that you would. God, would you help us to realign our hearts so that we can be in position to receive your outpouring? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So in 1960s, in the the late 1960s, there was a psychologist that started to look at some things, and he was researching something. And as he was researching, he wanted to answer the question to something called the small world problem. His name was, let me get his name right, because I don't want to give, I've been saying it wrong all day. His name is Stanley Milgram. I was calling him Stanley Pilgrim all day. (laughs) He attempted to find an answer to the problem called the small world problem, and here's what the study was, was trying to do. He wanted to see just how connected we were with one another. And so what he started to do was he started to conduct these experiments to see if he could get somebody, some random person in one state to be able to receive something from somebody in another state that did not even have any relationship with them. And so he gave a folder to this person in Nebraska and he said, I want you to get this envelope to this person in Massachusetts. And they didn't know who they were, but he figured if I can just see what happens, I'll be able to solve this problem called the small world problem. And so this person took this envelope, got it to somewhere in Massachusetts, and ultimately it got into the hands of the person that it was trying to get to by about three different links. So it took three different places to get to the final destination of the person that this other person had no idea who they were. And what he started to discover was that by about six different links, we can be connected to literally anyone all around the world. And most of us have heard this in pop culture called Six Degrees of Separation. See, you guys even know, I don't even have to finish saying it. Six Degrees of Separation. In the 80s and the 90s, there was Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon because you could basically align yourselves with this actor and say, I know him because I am six degrees separated from him. Let me give you an example. For example, 
I would try to get to a place where I could say, I would try to impress my kids or try to show people that, you know, I'm, I'm associated to a celebrity somehow. And so here's how it would work. My wife, Cheryl, has a cousin who has a son who one day appeared on the Ellen DeGeneres show, so somehow I know Ellen. It only took like four to get there, right? And some of us, we can say that we are associated to someone or something because of those different links that we try to connect, and we ultimately elevate ourselves to a celebrity status because I say, I know somebody that you don't know, right? You know somebody because you've been connected to them because somehow or some way you've connected the dots to make yourself associated to them, and they have no clue who you are, none, but you know them, and you know them well. Because you've stalked them, you've looked at their Instagram, their Facebook, you've looked at their Wikipedia page, you know everything about them, so you know them. And so when people ask, you talk like you've actually met them because you've stalked them. And it takes about six degrees to get there. But do you know that when this study was actually published, it was actually inconclusive because they could not actually find that it was true that it took six degrees to get to somebody. It actually was somewhere between six and 10, but then as they continued to study, they said, this doesn't work. And yet somehow it's still part of our brains because we still figure out how to associate ourselves to somebody that we don't even know in six degrees. And do you know that just as it is that we try to connect ourselves with somebody like that, and just as it is true that sometimes we can diagnose ourselves to some kind of disease that we don't have because we've gone on the internet and we've diagnosed ourselves to something because we have this disease or this symptom, and then now it is that we have this, when you just have a cold, right? (laughs) The same thing happens, too, when we try to connect ourselves to somebody that we don't even know, yet we've somehow made the connection that somehow we know somebody. And do you know that this phenomenon of connecting with somebody in that way is not just something that happens in pop culture, but it happens in the church too? Here's Here's what I mean. You have people oftentimes that you will meet that they say they know God, that they say they know who Jesus is, But it's not because they have actually known Jesus, because they've been with Jesus, but ultimately it's because at one point they knew somebody who went to church one day, who sat in a a chair and heard a message and they prayed once in a while and so they ultimately knew who Jesus was because they knew somebody who knew Jesus. I'm, I'm telling you, this one is hard. Because oftentimes what happens is we get to a place where we meet people who say, I know Jesus, and we look at them and we're like, really? Because that, oh, and I'm not judging you. But I know when somebody has met Jesus that their life has been transformed, that their life has changed. And it's a process. But ultimately, we know people, and all of us, and some of you probably thought of somebody, you're like, mm, I know who that is, and don't. Don't think about them. But we know people who say that they are connected to Jesus or they are associated to God simply because they have known somebody who actually knows him. And what happens when we get to that place is I believe that that is not only dangerous when things are normal, but it's even more dangerous when we are living in an outpouring of God's Spirit. And here's why it's dangerous, because we will ultimately end up missing God's outpouring because we are relying on somebody else to receive it for us. And we cannot allow other people to receive the outpouring that was meant for us because God has something for you and he has something for me, but I'm not going to receive it by being associated to you. I'm going to receive it by being associated and actually connected to God. Because can I tell you something? There is a danger in this, in that oftentimes we want to be in proximity to Jesus, but not live with Jesus. And a lot of times what happens is when we are in a time of outpouring, we miss revival simply not because of the fact that we don't know how to get to revival, but it's because we have chosen to be in proximity to him and not in relationship with him. 
Because ultimately, we have to live in revival and not be in proximity to revival. And in order to live in revival and not just be in proximity to revival, I'm going to give you how we do that in just a moment. But ultimately, you have to be committed to Jesus to be part of that. You can't just be associated to it. And this is something that has happened forever. It's something that oftentimes we see happen in Scripture where people are saying that they are connected to God, and yet when they actually, when it comes down to it and things get hard and things get difficult, the fruit shows that they actually didn't even know who Jesus was. See, in, there were times in John chapter 8 where Jesus would talk to the Pharisees and they would try to stake their faith claim, their legacy on being sons and daughters of Abraham. And Jesus would confront them and say, you say this, but you're actually acting like somebody else. And in reality, what he was trying to tell them is, look, if this is who you really were, you would understand who I am. And you would be in relationship with me and you would allow me to transform your life in Acts chapter 19, which is where we'll read today, Paul is just finishing his second missionary journey, and then he immediately goes back out on his third journey, and he goes to the city of Ephesus. And as he goes there, he's telling people about Jesus, and he's talking to them, and he's doing signs and wonders and performing miracles. And we get to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, and it says this, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. We haven't even heard it. And so Paul asked them, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. And Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And there were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and he spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. And they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. And so Paul left them, and he took the disciples with them and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And ultimately, after he's having these lectures with them and he's speaking to them about the kingdom and telling them all the great things about who God is and how Jesus is calling them to repentance and the Holy Spirit can live inside of them, ultimately, People are getting healed simply by just touching handkerchiefs and aprons that Paul had touched because the Spirit was so heavy on him that people were being healed. And skip down to verse 13, and here's where it gets fun. Verse 13 says this, Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. And they would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And one day, as they were trying to drive out the evil spirits, one day the evil spirit answered them. You ever had that happen to you? He said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? And the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. They got whooped. When this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. And many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas, basically a lot of money. And in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Do you see what happened? Paul, 
A man who would basically be described as one who was full of God's spirit. One that would say that they would say that when people just came near him, just because of how thick and heavy the spirit was upon him, they would be healed of their illnesses and of their diseases. They would be made well because this was a man who lived in revival. And if you look at what was taking place in that passage of scripture, revival was breaking out because people were being healed. People were coming to repentance. People were baptizing. People were placing their hope and their trust in Jesus, and they were being filled with God's spirit. And it was ultimately because Paul was there speaking over to them, telling them about the kingdom of God. Signs and wonders, miracles were taking place. All of this was happening And just outside of this revival taking place, which is what we are seeing here now, is a revival taking place all over this nation. Just on the outskirts of that revival, you have these people that were watching and they were like, that's pretty cool. So let me see if I can get in on that. Let me see if I can get on that hype because you know what? That, that, that looks really cool. People are being made well. I want to do that. And ultimately what you have is these people that were basically Jewish exorcists that were going around and they were trying to drive out evil spirits, but they weren't doing it from a place of relationship with God. They were doing it based on something they had seen on an association rather than a life lived in revival. And so they went, to, they went to this evil spirit and they were saying, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, be healed. And ultimately this evil spirit looks at them and he says, I know Jesus. I would run at his name. And I know Paul because I've, I've encountered Paul. But you... Who are you? And here's what was happening is these men were thinking that the association of what they thought in their mind, who they thought they knew, was enough to get them through to drive out evil spirits where they were. They thought that what they thought they knew was enough. They thought their association was enough to encounter the world. They thought that someone else's revival was good enough for them. They thought they're doing the hard work of repenting. They're doing the hard work of spending time with Jesus. We'll just take that name and do whatever we think we can do. And we'll associate to Jesus, but we won't really be connected to Jesus. We won't be in relationship with him. And do you understand that the only difference between Paul and these other men was Paul had sat at the feet of Jesus. Paul had sat at the feet of Jesus because he ultimately submitted his life to him. He surrendered everything he was to Jesus because he said, Jesus, I've done this and it was all bad. But when I sit at your feet, I recognize that life is difficult, but yet when I'm sitting at your feet, I have peace. And when I've sat at your feet, you fill me with your spirit and you equip me to go do the very thing that you have purposed inside of me to do. And so when I sit at your feet, when I go around and I do things, I recognize that I am not doing it in my own power, but I'm doing it fully equipped and empowered with the spirit of God inside of me. And then you have these other guys. I said, that sure looks good. Let me see if we can do it too. And here's what I believe happens in our lives is something very similar to that. We see people who are experiencing revival in their life because they have ultimately done the hard work of sitting at God's feet and saying, God, show me my heart. Show me if there are places inside of my heart that are not aligned to you and change me. Transform me. Fill me with your spirit. Overwhelm me. Allow me to sit at your feet. Allow me to worship you. Allow me to tell you how great you are. And realign me. Refocus me. Shift me. Move me in your path because your path is my purpose. 
And you have these other guys that said, well, that's a lot of work, and I would rather just do what I want to do and be able to say, I want to take part in it and sit on the outskirts and basically make it. But can I tell you that it's time? It is time for us who do not just want to see revival spoken of somewhere else, but want to see revival in our own hearts. It is time for us to do the hard work that says, God, I want to sit at your feet for no matter how long it takes until you search my heart so that I can come to a place of repentance so I can be realigned to what it is that you want to do. Church, it's time to stop playing around. And I'm telling you, it was hard. And yet, when you sit at God's feet, and you do the hard work of mining your heart, when you sit at God's feet and say, God, this is all yours. God, I want you to have your way inside of me. God, I want you to do what only you can do inside of me. God, I don't want to just hear about revival. I want to live in revival. God, I want to repent. And God, I want you to show me the areas of my life that I think are okay. And I want you to change me. When we are willing to do that, God will send us on a place and on a trajectory of revival simply because revival is not difficult. We try to make it into something big and something crazy, but in reality, this is all that revival is. It is us being willing to commit ourselves to Jesus wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly, being willing to say, Jesus, I commit to you my life. Jesus, I surrender to you. Jesus, I've tried doing it my way and it isn't worth it. Jesus, I want to do it your way. And so how do you do that? Let me give you three, let me give you three things that we can do. Actually, you know what? Let me make it easy for you today. Let me give you two things. Nah, I'm going to give you three. <laughs> Spend time in his word. Number one. Spend time in his word and allow yourself to come to a place that says, God, I'm going to see this world through the lens of your word. And I'm going to live my life in accordance to the words that you have spoken because, Jesus, if I'm going to be committed to you, I have to know about you. And the best place for me to learn about you is right here. When I open it and I sit there and I read and I understand your character and I know who you are and I know how much you love me, that is number one, commit to Jesus by reading his word. Can I challenge you? Read chap one chapter a day, just one. And get somebody to read it with you so if you have questions, you don't get lost. Have somebody that can help walk you through it. Number two, pray. Spend time in prayer. And it can be as simple as saying, you know what, this week I'm going to try by simply just praying for five minutes a day. Can we, five minutes? Oh my Lord. Five minutes. Five minutes a day. That's by the time the week is done. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Could you spend 30 minutes in a week in prayer? I'm not trying to ask you to go spend two hours in the prayer closet, though some of you might be there. Wonderful. Wonderful. For those that say, well, that's too hard, it might be, but take a step, five minutes, talk to God, tell him your heart, tell him where you are, allow him to speak back to you, be willing to be silent, and turn your phone over. Number three, and here's where it gets hard, be willing to repent. When you spend time in prayer, when you spend time reading his word and you find things in your life that are not the way that God has intended them to be, and you'll know, you'll know. When you spend those moments and God reveals to you those places, be willing to say, God, I am sorry for what I have made it. I am sorry for where I have been. And God, would you clean my heart up and would you fill me with your Holy Spirit so that, God, I can begin walking towards you again. 
See, we try to make it really difficult, but that's as simple as it is. It's just humbling yourself before God and saying, God, you are God and I am not. God, I want to follow your path, not mine. And God, I want to spend time with you because you were so good. And when that happens, that is the true mark of a church and a person that is living in revival and not living in proximity to it. When you have people that are willing to say, I will do the hard work of sitting there and allowing my heart to be searched. Even the parts I don't like to show nobody. When we do that, revival will not just be something that we hear about, but it'll be something that we live in. Because your heart and your life is refreshed and how overflowing with the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit in your life. And what will happen is when you encounter things in the world, because when you leave this place, there is a real world that we go out and we go to every single day. For some of us, it's called school. For some of us, it's called work. For some of us, it's called home. And when we encounter things that are difficult, that try to beat us and give us a whooping to send us crying, when we encounter those things, we can stand firm saying, I'm full of God's spirit. And I know Jesus for myself. And you can try to throw anything that you want at me, but nothing will stand up to my Jesus. And when you can say that, you can walk a life that is victorious, not a life that is like this. But you can stand tall because you know the God that lives in you. Because you have had your own personal encounter with Jesus, the one who can transform you. Because can I tell you, there is a world outside that is antagonistic to the revival that wants to take place in your heart. And you have to be willing to stand up and say, my God is bigger. My God is greater. You have to be willing to stand up in that place and in the face of that. And when you can do that, when you can do that, the revival will begin to take place in your life. Because that antagonism that comes against you, it will recognize the Jesus in you. Because the Jesus in you is greater than anything that could ever come against you. But here's the question. I'm going to ask you to stand with me for just a moment. The worship team is going to close for us. Are you willing to say, God, I want you more than anything else? Yes. Are you willing to say, God, I want to see the move of your spirit that you promised you would pour out on us? Are you willing to go beyond being content with just coming to church? Are you willing to say, God, I want more than just a Sunday interaction, but I want a life transformation that takes place on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday because God, I don't want to check a box anymore, but God, I want to live in your presence every single day. Are you willing to be at that place? Because if you are willing to be at that place, God will pour his spirit out on you. He will. Because when you are at that place, your heart is postured for revival. And so here's my question for you. Are you willing to move beyond being in proximity to Jesus? And are you willing to begin to live in his presence? Because it's time. It's time to move from hearing about Jesus and being associated to Jesus to living with Jesus. It's time to begin to live with God's Holy Spirit poured out every single day in our lives that we are so overflowing with his presence that people begin to notice something different about us because we have been transformed not just for Sunday morning but every single day of our lives because it's time. God wants to pour his spirit out 
but his spirit is looking for a heart that is willing to let him in. Not just for an hour on Sunday, but every day of the week. So as the worship team sings, I'll come back and close in just a moment. But what I'm going to ask you to, in this moment is if that is you and you were willing, you don't have to come to this space. But if you'd like to, to come and as a sign of repentance, you can do that. But you can do it from your seat as well. You can say, God, I want you to search my heart and show me the places that are not aligned with you God and help me to repent because I know that it is hard because I want my life to be aligned with you again if that's you as the band is singing would you offer that to God say God change me transform me renew me pour out your spirit on me and God I repent to you realign me Jesus it's your breath in our lives so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lives so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lives so we pour prefaced all of that taking place on the day of Pentecost Peter stood up before everybody that would hear him and he said this in the last days God says God says I will pour out my spirit on all people your sons and your daughters will prophesy your young men will see visions your old men will dream dreams and even on my servants both men and women I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below do you understand that revival has already been poured out for us it is just our heart that needs to be positioned and open to receive because God wants to pour out his spirit on you but our hearts have to be in that place so as we go to prayer today, if that is you, 
you say, God, I want you to pour your spirit out on me. Would you be willing to repent today? Would you be willing to realign yourself to follow after God, to follow after where the Spirit is leading? If that's you, as we pray, would you lift your hands? Jesus, today we say that you are great. Heavenly Father, we thank you for pouring your Spirit out. God, we believe that we live in the time, in the era of revival because you have already poured your Spirit out. But God, we don't want to miss it. We don't want to just hear a revival. We don't want to just see if it's so, as it's something that's far away, but we want to experience revival in our own hearts, in this city, in this church. God, we want to see your spirit poured out. You have already promised that you would do it, God, and today we receive it. God, because we know that when your spirit is poured out, everything changes. God, our brokenness is made well. We are made whole. Our addiction, we can be free from it. God, we are knowing. We know, God, that when your spirit is poured out and when you move us to repentance, God, we will not just hear a revival, but we will live in it. And God, we want to live in revival. We don't just want to hear about Jesus. We want to know Jesus for ourselves, God. Lord, today, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice, whether they're watching online, they're in this room that says, today, I want to place my hope in Jesus. Today, would you wrap your arms around them, Lord, and let them know, God, that right now, in this moment, they are your son and your daughter, and that as they are your son and your daughter, you have already promised to pour out your spirit on them. Jesus, have your way in our hearts. God, we don't just want a Sunday transformation, but we want to be transformed and made new every single day of our lives. Jesus, have your way in us, we pray. Lord, today, we ask that you would search our hearts. As hard as that might be, would you show us the places in our hearts, God, that are not following after you? Would you show us the places in our hearts, God, that are not turned toward you? And God, would you help us to realign so that, God, your presence can flow, so that your spirit can live inside of us, Jesus, because that's all we want. We just want you and your presence, God. And we thank you, Lord, that you receive us just as we are, but you don't leave us that way. You make us new. So God, have your way, and God, help us to walk out of here with hearts that have been refreshed, that can say, great is our God. And no matter what comes against us, God, we can know that it is your spirit that lives in us. We don't just know about him. We didn't just hear about him. But God, he takes residence as the king of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen.